Good evening and welcome. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Soraya Chamali. Soraya is an award-winning writer, activist, and media critic whose writing appears regularly in national and international media, including The Atlantic, The Nation, Huffington Post, Verge, Quartz, Time, Salon, The Guardian, and The New Statesman. She speaks frequently on topics related to inclusivity, free speech, sexualized violence, data, and technology. She's the director of the Women's Media Center Speech Project and organizer of the Safety and Free Speech Coalition. She currently serves on the national boards of the Women's Media Center and Women Action and the Media, as well as on the advisory councils of the Center for Democracy and Technology, Vita, and Common Sense Media. As an activist, Ms. Shamali has uh, spearheaded multiple successful campaigns challenging corporations to address online harassment and abuse, restrictive content moderation and censorship, and institutional biases that affect free speech. In 2013, Soraya won the Association for Education and Journalism and Mass Communications Donna Allen Award for Feminist Advocacy and the Secular Woman Feminist Activism Award. In 2014, she was named one of Elle's Magazine's 25 Inspiring Women to Follow on Social Media. In 2016, Soraya was the recipient of the Women's Institute for Freedom of the Press's Women and the Media Award. In 2017, she was the co-recipient of the Newhouse Mirror Award for Best Single Feature for an in-depth investigative report on free speech and online content moderation, The Secrets of the Internet and a Wikipedia Distinguished Service Award for exemplary contributions to the advancement of public knowledge and the collection, development, and dissemination of educational content. Most recently, Soraya has authored her new book to rave reviews titled Rage Becomes Her, The Power of Women's Anger. Tonight, Soraya is here to discuss her new book in which she urges 21st century women to embrace their anger and harness it as a tool for lasting personal and societal change. After Soraya speaks, she will be in conversation with one of NYU DC's esteemed instructors of journalism, Seth Borenstein. We will then have some time for Q&A after. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Soraya. Um, thank you, Gabby. Um, and also thank you, Gabby, for this happening tonight, because it was through your introduction that, that we're here tonight. Um, I'd like to also thank you all for being here. I know it's the end of a long day, at the end of a long week, at the end of a long year. Um, so uh, I hope that you find the, the conversation that we have uh, intriguing and worth your time. I started writing a book about women in anger last September. And the idea for the book had been something that I'd thought about for a long time and uh, was the, 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 the cumulative effect of many years of writing about the status of women uh, globally in pretty much any aspect of culture. So I've written about religion and politics and art, um, but pretty much everything from a lens of what the world looks like if you're not centering the experiences of men and in the United States of white men, generally speaking, who run our corporations and our technology. So after the election, uh, it seemed fairly obvious that anger was really palpable. On the right, uh, women's anger really drove support for Trump. Before the election, surveys showed that conservative white women were the angriest people in the country. They registered more anger and more sustained anger than anybody else. After the election, they passed that baton to liberal women. What might be surprising to people, though, is that women in general do report feeling angry more often and for longer periods of time. We tend to associate anger with men and masculinity, but in fact, consistently, women are saying that they are feeling angry and, and um, that the anger lasts longer. And so, it's not as surprising as it might seem that both before and after the election, women with different political orientations reported higher levels. The book itself really starts with socialization. Why is it that we have the stereotypes and ideas about anger that we do? Generally speaking, we tend to associate anger with men and masculinity, and that starts by the time we're three or four. So preschool children will look at an angry face and they will assign masculinity to that face. 
And so the lessons that we learn about emotions begin immediately, and uh, while they never end, they're particularly strong in the formation of our childhood identities. Girls, on the other hand, learn that emotionality is theirs, but not anger, which is um, problematic in many dimensions, which is what I try and talk about in the second chapter, where I really begin to extrapolate from the early years what the social construction means as we go through adolescence and into adulthood. From there, I focus in the, uh, in the book on the relationship between anger and pain, both mental distress and physical pain. I was really surprised by the effect that mismanagement of anger has on the body. We know that it's related to anxiety, depression, eating disorders, a whole range of self-harming behaviors. But it wasn't clear to me before I started doing this research how much the diversion of anger in unhealthy ways is also implicated in autoimmune diseases, cardiovascular illnesses, and the, the ability to respond to pain and recover from illness. A lot of the sicknesses globally that we think of as women's sicknesses are ailments um, that are informed by mismanaged anger. And that seemed like important information to me, both personally and in terms of our politics. The um, next step in the, in the approach that I took was then to look at the way anger functions in the workplace and in schools, what everyday discrimination, gender discrimination, racial discrimination, homophobia means in our day-to-day -day lives, we learn as girls and women to minimize negative emotions and impacts on us. We ourselves trivialize our uh, needs by using minimizing language. So instead of saying I'm angry, we might say I'm irritated. Uh, instead of saying I'm angry as adults, we'll say we're stressed. Women around the world record much higher levels of stress than men do, um, largely as the result of having an endless mandate that they care. There's an entire chapter, for example, on what I call the care mandate, which is the provision of free labor um, to take care of children and the elderly and um, people with disabilities. That free labor is really the driving engine of our economy, and we don't ever uh, recognize that for what it is. Separate from that, from this idea that we care, is uh, the, the impact that being expected to be mothers has on our lives. Whether we choose to be mothers or not, and whether we care to be child-free or not, and whether we can or cannot have children ourselves, this idea that we are all mothers in waiting and that it should make us joyously happy at all times is really oppressive to us. And so even if you're a young single woman, in the workplace, if you are in what employers think of as the fertile zone, your salary, your tenure, your promotions are all calibrated to the idea that you might have a baby. So in one survey, 40% of managers in the UK openly admitted that they would not hire a woman if they could, if they could help it in that age range. So the chapter itself is about what it means to be denied the right to control what happens within your own body, and what it means to come at the issue of reproduction from the perspective of people who do not actually themselves carry babies. And so that leads straight into this question of our politics. Why is there so much denial about what women say? And why is there this crush of silencing that happens in our media? And so by denial, I mean um, responses that challenge the idea that we can be knowers instead of pleasers. So that when girls and women speak, there's the incessant interrupting. There's the tone policing of what we are saying and the ways we are saying it. There's the rejection that what we are saying has value in the society. And um, I spent a lot of time documenting examples of that because there is indeed so much denial <laughs> that that is the case. Silencing is a little bit different. 
than that. There's denial in the form of, for example, men being twice as likely to say they don't believe people who come forward with stories of assault. Why is it that men doubt what women are saying? So right now we're having a conversation about Me Too, and um, I sort of laugh at the idea that people expect Me Too to have accomplished some major feat in the last year compared to 4,000 years of misogyny, right? But indeed, the problem we have right now with Me Too is not a problem with bad men. It's a problem with good men. It's a problem with the doubt that good men consistently show in the face of what women are saying. And so there is a lot uh, that I write about related to why that might be. What is it about protecting masculinity that takes priority over respecting women and their rights? And then I try and conclude in the book with this idea of anger competence. What does it mean to reject the idea that anger is inherently negative? There's definitely the anger of resentment. We see the anger of resentment every day in our politics. It's an anger that looks back, right? So when we want to make America great again, that is an anger of resentment. But anger equally is fueled by compassion and the drive for social justice. We, I think, need to be able to embrace anger that has compassion and empathy and joy. And that's what the book concludes with, um, some guidance about what that might look like in your personal life and how to acknowledge the degree to which our interpersonal relationships really are the core of our political lives. So I'm going to conclude there, and Seth's going to join me, and we'll have a conversation. That one's working. Oh. So we might as well start with the elephant in the room, the yes. White House, the Supreme Court, because um, the timing could not be better for your book. Uh, let's talk about the uh, Kavanaugh hearings. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to leap right in? Yeah, well, or, or, <laughs> <laughs> so let's just, with, with uh, Dr. Ford, she did not show anger. No. She, I mean, would you would that be fair to say she you know she kept she was composed she was composed and I, I think that I think it's pretty obvious that it was a pitch perfect example of double standards right he could wield his anger as an entitlement and it sat on top of the assumption that he had a core rationality that he was a thinking person and that if he felt indignant in his own self defense that was justifiable and. Um, a, a marker of his integrity, autonomy, and citizenship. If she got angry, she would have been dismissed roundly as an irrational, vindictive woman. Because there is no assumption that women have a core rationality. If we happen to be clear thinkers, it's a nice perk that sits on top of our immense capacity to feel. And so he threw a temper tantrum and in fact was so lacking in, his, in a measured response um, that one would think that would disqualify him as a jurist. She, on the other hand, stayed composed. And not only did she stay composed, but she continuously deferred to the people judging her. And, and so, you know, this idea that women are supposed to put others at ease at all times and that that should take priority over our self-defense, because that's what we learn as girls. Don't upset the people around you. Don't do it, right? I mean, there is not a girl on the planet that doesn't learn that lesson. And so by the time girls are seven or eight, they're being encouraged three to four times more frequently to use their nice voices. They're actively discouraged from being assertive or being aggressive. If they are black girls, they're actively punished for being assertive or being confident. And so we learn very early that there's no distinction being made for girls between assertiveness, aggression, and anger. 
all of those things get all wrapped up together and rejected. If you have a young girl who's in kindergarten who is black and she is confident and you know, described as maybe sassy, she's considered belligerent. And the behavior that she might be exhibiting and that is then punished for, because young black girls are suspended or expelled at five times the rates of their white peers, um, the behavior that she, she might be engaging in is seen in a young white boy as leadership potential, you know? And so that policing starts very early. And so what we saw in the courtroom was a woman who not only was testifying about her own experiences, but was also an expert witness about the topic at hand. And I think the saddest moment in the entire day was when she used the word collegiality. And I don't know if anybody remembers that. She asked a question. She was asked if she, maybe if she wanted water, and she didn't want to put people out of their way or if she wanted a break. And she said, no, I'm used to collegiality. And that was kind of heartbreaking because it really showed that she expected to be respected as a peer. You know, you have collegiality with people for whom you have mutual respect, for whom you have a working relationship that's based on equal dignity. And the people that rejected her simply did not treat her with collegiality. They had no intention of treating her as an equal. And so, you know, I don't think there could have been a better example, really, of the ways in which emotional expression differ, differs, and also the way in which emotionality is attributed to women, but then weaponized against them. So it's fair to say that it did not work for her because Justice Kavanaugh is now on the Supreme Court. Right. Would you then, in retrospect, think that she should have shown some righteous anger? Well, and would that have been even worse, you think? Well, I think this is a, a, a really good example of the double bind that women are constantly in, right? I mean, you are penalized either way. You're penalized for showing the emotion, and you're penalized for not showing the emotion. And so it's very difficult in the moment for any of us to know what the right path to take is. It's interesting because women are allowed to get angry if they do it on someone else's behalf. So especially if they do it in the capacity of a nurturer. So if you're a woman and you have strong political sentiments and you frame those as a mother, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, the Children's Defense Fund, the Temperance Movement, Moms for, Sa for Rational Gun Control. I mean, they're all of these political movements that have shifted the culture, and it's like the women that propel them in anger have to tip their hats at this idea that, yes, we know we're mothers and we understand our role. Now let us say our piece, right? But outside of that, it's very hard. If we defend ourselves in anger, the risks are pretty great, I think. So getting back to the question, mm -hmm. should she have shown more anger? any anger? I don't know the answer to that question because yeah, I think that... Yeah, you encourage people to show anger. Well, I encourage people to understand their anger, yes. to acknowledge it, to understand it, and then to strategize in its use. There are lots of ways to show anger. I can show anger by writing a song, right? Mm -hmm. I can show anger by cooking a super bad meal. Like, there are so <laughs> many ways to show anger that don't include the anger that we associate with men, like Kavanaugh. I mean, she could have wigged out and been rude and smug and contemptuous, and that wasn't good for anybody, right? But there was no other mechanism for her to show anger. I mean, if cooking a bad meal would not have done shown. No, in, in the room that she was in, it is possible, for example, and I say this with the full understanding that there is no way to know what it was like to be that woman sitting in that chair. She started off admitting she was terrified. That is how she began the conversation. So I don't want to second guess her judgment in deciding to speak the way she did. However, her, her deferential mean is known to actually encourage trust in very traditional men, right? Because it's not gender transgressive. Yes. But I really think that that was a context in which regardless of what she had done or said, the decisions were made. Nothing she would have done would have changed those minds. Because in fact, the, the 
response to the entire charade was, well, something bad did happen to her, but she's confused. She doesn't know what she's talking about. So not only was there the humiliation and the denial, but the silencing in the form of this gaslighting. Of course she knew what she was talking about. She's 100% sure. There's not a woman on earth whose mouth has been held closed, who's been pinned down by a drunk person she knows who doesn't know the name and face of that person, right? And so I personally think no matter what she had done, it wouldn't have mattered. Which brings us to another good topic here, which is denial. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned a bit of it there. Yes. Uh, there you and I have a, a, a commonality. Yes. You write about climate change. You get a lot of denial. So are you saying, you're saying essentially that no matter what, the people who voted to confirm Kavanaugh would have voted no, mat no matter what. Mm -hmm. So why, why do so, you think that is? So the overlap in our work, yeah. uh, as we were discussing, um, there's uh, something called identity protective cognition. And identity protective cognition is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. You will see and believe the facts that allow you to protect yourself and your identity and your status. So in the cognitive sciences, there's a lot of research that has been done looking at how people perceive risk. Who perceives risk and why do they perceive the risks that they do? And so in Seth's work, for example, climate change, we know there are climate change deniers. Climate change deniers fit a very specific profile in the United States. They tend to be conservative white men who have a focus on indiv individualism and um, they have an outlier risk perception. They do not see the risks that the rest of us in society see. And so if you looked at a graph of risk, they would literally be up in a corner, isolated on their own. Now those same men tend to have the highest status in the society. The same cohort of people also believe that we shouldn't have gun control, that women shouldn't be allowed to get abortions without being punished, that food toxicity is not an issue, that environmental degradation is being exaggerated. In virtually every serious political debate that we have as a society, those people fitting that description have this risk assessment and it leads to the denial of what the rest of us understand as facts. That denial is similar in the denial of women's stories of sexual harassment and assault. So much of the work that you're talking about goes to the Yale Cognition uh, yes. Lab, Dan Cahan. Mm -hmm. But Cahan also shows that contrary to some work done by colleagues in NYU in New York, yes that this cuts both ways, liberal mm -hmm. and conservative. Yes. Uh, his studies have shown that even smart people who know math will deliberately misunderstand numbers if it contrasts with their political yes. level. Yes, they would prefer fake liberals. information. Yes, that's And liberals right. who will look at numbers provided that shows, you know, and these numbers are ginned up for the study's purpose, show that gun control somehow works. This is, I mean, somehow, you know, that more guns means less crime. They will not see it in the numbers, even though they know how numbers work. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, for conservatives who show numbers of gun control does work. So you have this on both ends. Is that fair to say? No. no. Even though the studies show that, isn't that? Then aren't you by nature showing exactly what Gahan says? So I don't, <laughs> I've read most of his studies, mm. and I'm trying to think of the ones you're talking about. Well, I'll go, I'll go look yeah. for those. But I think his studies, identify this category of people as being consistently in this space of risk perception, whether they're conservatives or liberals sometimes, but it differs based on the topic and the locale, right? So if you're in Sweden, it's men and women who are in that quadrant and minorities who are not in that quadrant. And so I think the issue really that he points to is this question of status and who's protecting what status in society, right? Uh, or he looks at just in your, you're in your bubble and you do not want to come out of your bubble, whether it is a liberal DC Tacoma Park bubble right. or the you know, um, a Texas conservative bubble. So let me we, give you an example. Let me give you an example and you can tell me what you think that research would show. 
we know that more than 50% of men in the United States think sexism is dead and is no longer relevant. And um, we know that in responses to what just happened with Kavanaugh, more than 60% of women said they believed the women who came forward, but only 30% of men said they believed the women who came forward. And so in those instances, it makes a lot of sense that Me Too's interrogation of masculinity is an identity threat, and that men are inclined to deny those claims because of threats to status and identity, regardless of their political orientation, right? Okay, Seth, let me quote from your own book here. Mm -hmm. Um, to page 250, I happen to be. Yes. <laughs> uh, you have the 215 survey, 2015 survey of American, uh, heterosexual American men that 34% wanted a romantic partner. Yes. Who is independent. But yes. But 66% wanted their daughters to be independent. Right. So not their partners. Not they their want partners. wives who are supportive and docile and daughters who are independent and aggressive. So, uh, now you can look, you know, isn't that just their comfort bubble or is that showing they don't want to be challenged? I think that's narcissism. They're seeing their daughters an extension of themselves. I, 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 think that, I think that this idea that women are constantly defined by their relationships to men is so deeply embedded in the culture that we can't see past our noses. I mean, we still live in a society where only 10% of women feel comfortable changing their names. Every time you're identified, you're identified as a freestanding man with Mr. Every time one of us is identified, we're like Ms. or Mrs. And God forbid you use Ms., right? Because the first primary identifier on any internet form that I have to fill out asks me to state my relationship to a man. But it also gives you the option of Ms. Not always. Sometimes if I filled out the word doctor, it would automatically categorize me as a man, right? Which happens to women all the time. And so all of those biases are being built into our technology and our algorithms. But the fundamental, the fundamental idea is that we are constantly defined by these relationships in ways that men are free not to be. And I think that's what's reflected in these men who would like to have caring, nurturing women around them, but daughters who go out into the world with independence. So you don't see any hope in that, looking at that and saying, any hope in that survey? In that survey, or just to bring this back to Kavanaugh. So during the coverage of Dr. Ford's testimony, before Kavanaugh spoke, mm -hmm. on Fox News, of all places, Chris Wallace was talking, oh my god, my daughters told me this. Yes. And I did not believe it, but now, now I, I do. And now I do. Do you see that as an opening and hope, or do you just see that as narcissism? Oh, I definitely see it as narcissism. I think it might be an opening, but I think we're well past the time where men have any excuse to say they don't understand anymore. Women have been saying these things for a very, very long time. Now we're saying it with the scope and amplification properties of the internet, which enables us also to do what a lot of men demand, which is that we prove what we've said, right? So I no longer have to explain to someone that I spent the day fending off men who were threatening to rape me because I said boys should be allowed to play with dolls. All I have to do is take a screen capture of the threats. And you know that's a difference in my life because it, it's a waste of time for us to keep trying to explain what this discrimination looks like. And yet we are constantly being forced to do that. And so when a man who is a good man says, I didn't know this about my daughter's lives, I think it begs the question of why not? Because I have a father who's conservative, who loved me and wanted to protect me, but this is what I think is so important in the conversation right now. And it is that protecting masculine identity is hurting women tremendously. So we know that boys learn to provide and to protect, right? If women are saying they don't feel safe, then men interpret that as failure. They're failing to protect which is scary, right? Nobody wants to fail. And so if you think that you're protecting the women around you and you're being told that is not true, what are you supposed to do with that information? It is an impossible ideal for men to protect the women around them. They would have to glue themselves to them 24 seven, right? Not gonna happen. So that means men double up on the providing sense. 
I should be the provider. And what does Me Too do? Me Too actually says we want equality in the workplace. We don't want male dominance in the workplace. So it's a double-edged sword to believe that too. Because if women are saying you are, as a class of people, benefiting from the behaviors of bad men, that's deeply uncomfortable. So there's a triple whammy. There's the, huh, maybe we're not protecting the way we are supposed to. Maybe we're not needed as providers anymore. What happens to our privileges and power? Because the traditional trade has always been men will have privileges and power in return for providing and protecting. So it's not the fact that women might be lying about innocent men that's really scary. It's the fact that they're telling the truth. That's a much harder proposition for the society to absorb, which is where I think we are right now. Thank you. Is there also a problem with, especially males who are fathers, like myself, mm -hmm. who have just, in general, and it's, it might it be societal, you know, the way society raises, we tend to not interact emotionally with our children as much. When a child has a problem, they go to their mother, generally. At least, you know, I have you know, sons, so that's what I see, you know, and that could be different. Mm -hmm. Is this also partly that there is, le I mean, you know, it would, you know, would cause some problems, but that the relationship has never been made in, you, could, you know, you say, you, you know, the, as a father you say, you could talk to me about anything, well, even when I talk to my sons, they don't want to talk about social life. Right. There is just a divide that I don't think is there between mothers and children, that there is between fathers and children. I think that might be generational. And I also think that that's up to us as parents, right? So we know that it really hurts boys not to be given full range of their emotions. It is cruel and punishing to boys to tell them that their main mode of communication is going to be through anger and aggression and violence, which is what too many boys learn. So for boys to be allowed to be sad or to show vulnerability is perceived in many homes as a sign of feminizing weakness, which is deeply sexist in and of itself, right? But we need to be able to give boys the freedom of their full emotional range. And, and we need to be able to allow them to convey vulnerability if they have needs. And in the absence of that, what we have instead is high rates of male suicide and high rates of gender-based violence against women and, we, and, and more ma marginal people. That is a horrible plague on our society. And it's a plague that could really be mitigated by re-envisioning childhood socialization. I think that men are completely capable of nurturing in the same capacity as women. There is nothing about a boy or man constitutionally that prohibits him from fulfilling that role in society at all. And so there are many children who feel much more comfortable talking to their fathers than their mothers. That's just not the dominant mode in the society. Um, now, there's a lot I want to get to <laughs> in about six minutes before I, it, it's your chance. So let's go through some sort of more rapid. If you don't mind, um, one of the things in the book that struck me, and it might be generational, is can you tell us a story of uh, Toaster Boy. Yes. And, and <laughs> actually, just tell us the story. So I was speaking at a school a few years ago, and it was uh, freshmen and sophomores in college. We were talking about sexting, sexual violence, uh, just general relationships and health and how those related to structural power. And we specifically were talking about non-consensual sharing of sexualized images. And it happens to both boys and girls, but it happens overwhelmingly that girls usually are the targets of that. By the age of 11 or 12, boys are three to five times more likely to non-consensually share images. Even though boys and girls within relationships share equally those images, the non-consensual proliferation of those images is an unequal distribution. And so a young man stood up and he said to me, well, if a girl gives me her naked picture, what's the difference, if it's mine, between my sharing that and my sharing a picture of my toaster? And I had about five minutes left 
and about seven things went through my head at once, right? Because what are you supposed to say about that? Wh what do you, how do you respond to that? I mean, are you really, like I really found myself thinking, do I have to explain that a woman is different from a toaster to this boy? You know, and I actually didn't do a very good job. I literally looked at him, I think, and I said, well, in the beginning there was darkness because I don't know where to start with you, right? So, so, but in fact, he did something that is very common and that all of us do at a fundamental level, which is that he objectified this woman immediately. And that had several effects. One was every woman in the room, by extension, was similarly objectified. She had to either imagine herself as the woman in the picture or maybe as him and being abusive to the woman in the picture, right? But it turns out that um, starting at the age of about six, girls in the United States already identify as sex objects. And that when we as adults look at pictures of men and women, we see them very differently. Men are seen as whole people, whereas we identify women by their parts. We identify women by their breasts or their legs or their arms or their eyes. And there's really no ability for us in this society to unlearn that or as very young people to not learn that because it's so pervasive in the atmosphere. And did any of the women in that audience say anything? Say anything. No, none of the women in the audience said anything. And he and I were sort of having a conversation and I was very aware that for any of the women in the audience to actually say something meant that they would have to incur a risk that they then lived with at school. Because it, we also know that for a woman in college to advocate on her own behalf as a feminist ends up ha not very well for her. <laughs> you know, women who do that, like black people who advocate for the rights of black people or gay people who adv advocate for the rights of gay people are um, socially penalized often for doing that. If you have an ally do it on your behalf, uh, results tend to be better. So did any of the men say anything? Oh gosh, no. None of the men said And you're that. not surprised? No, I'm, new, I'm not surprised by that because actually, Men are held to even higher and more rigid norms of masculinity. There's a deeper betrayal for men to stand up against other men in these environments, which makes the risk to men also very high. So the fraternal ethos of the culture per permeates everything. See, I must not be part of that culture. That's good. No, but I mean, it, it just doesn't fit with what I see because my friends and I and everyone I sort of grew up with would just you said I'll something give, right away. I'll give you an example, though. I grew up Catholic. Did you grow up in a religious home? Uh, not particularly, but my kids are Catholic and my wife is Catholic, so right. I am sort of Catholic adjacent. You're Catholic adjacent. So, so I think that as a young Catholic girl, it was very clear to me that women's inability to be priests was an aggressive act against me personally. Right? That's not how most people perceive that. However, I don't think there was a man in my family who would have stood up, even though they loved me and respected me, and had it out with the local priest about that, right? Actually, I would think that in my uh, family, my wife's family, my family, yeah. there are men who would say that. That's good, right? So, That's a good maybe thing. Maybe I'm just in a different world. But, but I, I, I don't think. Hashtag not all men. Not yes, all men. It gets us to not all men. Yeah. I mean, but it, it, but, but I also... It is, this, it is a different world. I mean, I look I, I through this and say... Is, it, I don't think it's a different world. I actually think that it's pretty undeniable that it is difficult for men to stand up in the presence of sexist jokes and sexist humor and pornography. I think that's well established, like studied, understood, not uh, up for grabs. Like, it's just the way the culture operates. I mean, I don't know. I will ask the people here. How many young men think it's easy to stand up and say, turn off the porn, or stop making the rape joke, or that was really sexist, or stop interrupting her? Show of hands of men who think that's easy. I've done it. I that's don't great. See it. But I think you're an anomaly in that case. And I don't think it's relevant to attribute your experience no. to okay. the culture. All right. Right? I, I mean, there are times when I want to do that, and I don't do it, right? But I think that it's very, very difficult, especially for boys and adolescents to do it. Because adolescence is the most concentrated time of the enforcement of those gender norms. 
and we see it over and over and over again in the policing of children, especially in parochial schools. Okay. So we know that bullying is the worst in parochial schools, which makes sense because parochial schools are basically operating with sort of authoritarian belief systems that are really rigid about gender and sexuality. But I think you could toss in most private schools along with parochial schools. Not at the same levels. Like studies show that parochial schools have the highest level of bullying. And yes, there are real entitlements in private schools. And those are abiding. And we understand what hierarchies look like in those spaces. But there's, there's I mean, you can go back and look at the research too. Yeah. But it's definitely parochial schools are sitting up here, and then private schools, and then public schools for bullying, if we categorize bullying, which, by Although the way. Bullying is going on quite a bit in public schools. Bullying's going on everywhere. Yeah. But the other thing, too, is traditionally, we've never called sexism bullying. It's just the way we talk about girls, right? So don't throw like a girl. She's such a whiny bitch. That's not considered bullying. That's just like the way people talk. So and the problem with that is that's now moving into machine learning. That's the thing. So machine learning is actually being trained on linguistic databases that use fundamentally discriminatory language in those ways without recognizing them as oppressive to women in the public sphere, which is a whole other conversation. OK, so let, let's open up to questions here. So before you ask your question, we have two volunteers on, on each side. So hold your hand up, and they'll come to you. Shouldn't show preference to my students, but Mia. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mia. How yes. are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. Um, so I have a question that's just kind of turning uh, to a different point right now. But I just wanted to ask, um, what do you believe, uh, how does white feminism and white women victimhood create a negative dichotomy against black women and the aggression that black women have been presented as um, showing behaviors? Um, how does that like dichotomy um, have, has that been created slash how is that like perpetuated in society? So I think that that is such a fundamental part of American history. The weaponization of white women's tears and anger as a lever of racial oppression, right? So we know that in our society, the most innocent pure person who is in need of defense is a small white girl. Blonde. Blonde. And that, that, that rationalization is used over and over and over again to justify white male aggression against brown and black bodies. And that's, you know, we see that every single day in our news, right? And so the question that, that I think, well, let me back up a second. If I had said that sentence on air two years ago, uh, I would have gotten a lot of pushback. You know, saying the words white supremacy or white male supremacy or even white feminism, were um, deeply offensive to people who had the power and authority to edit my language out of my writing or broadcasts. It's a positive thing that that is not true today. Like today, there are really spaces where you can have the conversation and the question that you just asked. But I don't think that as a society, we are familiar enough with the dynamic you just described. And so it's really important to have those conversations openly. It's very important for white women to have those conversations. Does, is everyone aware of what we're talking about in terms of this, this mechanism? Um, and so, you know, what's interesting to me is we have all of these instances in the last few months of women policing spaces like pools and sidewalks and lemonade stands. And what I find interesting about that is that they're using white femininity to enact a sort of toxic border patrol mentality that on a national scale is a really masculine assertion of nationality and of, of domination. But they're doing it in the spaces where they have power, which are private domestic spaces. Does that answer your question? Yeah. OK. And when we go over here. Why did uh, conservative white women? Uh, can you speak into the mic? Uh, vote for or elect for Trump, what did they get out of voting for, so, for him? So, you know, I think conservative white women in particular benefit from their proximity to white men with power and, and social entitlement, right? Because that proximity, that racial the whiteness conveys with it all kinds of privileges in the society and benefits in the society. 
But what we never talk about when we talk about conservative white women is the level of gender inequality in their own personal lives. So, so the, the women most likely to support Trump tended, or, or the women most likely to have authoritarian beliefs tend to be white Protestant evangelicals and Catholics in this country, right? And so those authoritarian beliefs include gender policing, include supporting torture for possible, tor uh, for possible terrorists, include spanking children, for example. There's all of this rules and punishment, rules and punishment. And so within that context, if you are living with gender inequality and you can leverage racial supremacy, then you can secure your status, you can offset differences in your status that way. These are not conscious things. I don't want to. I don't want to imply that this is conscious, but I do think it's the psychology of the voting pattern. Globally, we know that the people who are the quickest to adopt authoritarian leaders are women in situations of gender inequality, because they are looking for a strong person who's going to enforce rules that might protect them more, even from predations in their own lives. And that's what we're not talking about. What does gender inequality look like in these? very religious environments, for example. What does it mean for women to be constrained, even if they themselves are systems justifying, which they are. We, we understand systems justification mentalities. And so that's how I would describe that vote. Okay, let's move over here. Second, oh, you got it already, sorry. Got the mic. <laughs> Hi, so. Don't let go. <laughs> oh, please let Along go the lines of done. what, um, our first question, so we talked a little bit about white feminism and what I think the beginnings of the conversations about white exceptionalism and how, how painful that is to feel like your status is being challenged or you're, you're somehow to blame. Right. As this interview has unfolded, in my perspective, I think we've witnessed some evidence of male exceptionalism um, in the, well, not in my family, not in my household, not in my circle of right. men. Okay. How, do we, how do we talk about that? Especially, especially when we are, as women with rage, right? Where do we? How can we work with that? So I think a few things. I think of them. I think of this as Thanksgiving dinner conversations, right? You're sitting at the table, and then we have a conversation. We just met, by the way. <laughs> we we don't know each other. We just had that conversation for the first time. The not all men conversation is what you're talking about. And in fact, this is why I want to make this distinction between what we think of as bad men and good men and the protection of masculinity, right? Because not all men comes from a place of fear. I'm not a bad man. Yeah. I'm not that person. I haven't raped anybody. I've tried my hardest to provide and protect, right? But what we're really, really needing to focus on is what that means. What does it mean to provide and protect? Women are providing and protecting every day. I mean, I made a joke about the kitchen, but in fact, we are providing the world food. We grow most of the food. We cook most of the food. We buy most of the food. We provide safe food. So we educate, like we're providing and protecting day and night, but we don't call it providing and protecting because we, we aren't male and masculine. We, we call it nurturing, right, or mothering. In, in essence, these are the same things. We should have more flexible definitions for what it means to provide and protect. There's nothing, there's nothing inherently wrong with these virtues of masculinity. It's just that if they're used for domination and for this sort of exclusive track to power in the society and resources, that's the problem. So I try very hard when I encounter not all men to bludgeon people with statistics. <laughs> it's just my way. I'm like, actually, no, you know. Um, but also to have a conversation that is, well, why would you want to react that way? What possible motivation would you have for arguing with me? Because in fact, one of the biggest issues with denial um, and denial of discrimination, racist and sexist discrimination, is that people will accept fraudulent, trumped up data if it confirms their belief systems. On both sides. Yes, but when it comes to sexism, no. So women, for example, are not believing trumped up data that says sexism exists just because they want to believe that. But men are doing the opposite. Because some of the data Kahan would show, uh, not on sexism in general, yes. but in general, 
on all the. On I will work with you uh, to get yes. him to do I will this connect research. You with them. Like, honest to God, I would love to do that research. Because I have looked at the other research. Mm -hmm. And yes, women might believe trumped up data, because that would be the human thing to do. Mm -hmm. But in the instances that currently exist, men given the option of believing actual data versus fraudulent data, believe the fraudulent data. But women given actual data versus fraudulent data about sexism do not. And I don't know how Dan would explain that. But I, it's, I, I don't think, I think that that is a false equivalence in this particular case. Uh, I, I do want to go on, but it's not my turn. Um, on the, how about all the way at the end here? On the left. Now wait for the mic, please. Thank you. Do you find any correlation between anger and this obsession to rush to a presumption of guilt? before any due process actually happens in our society? So I haven't seen any correlations that indicate that. But what I find interesting about the presumption of guilt is that, uh, the presumption of innocence, is that it's extended to men who are accused, but not to women who are accusing. Lock her up. Right? Well, that's versus, a whole other thing. That's But, but I mean, tests, is it, right? that is lock her up versus it's a hoax. You know, it's interesting. I think that lock her up as philosopher Kate Mann has written extensively about is more about containing women. It's more about contempt and anger and disgust with women who want to claim public authority. It's not so much about the presumption of guilt. I think that might be di different in this because lock her up is now being used globally against women everywhere who are running for office. Right, so we know that we have these authoritarian strains uh, in, uh, around the world, and we can see that they are strongly related, and that they are networked, and that they support each other. And indeed, when Steve Bannon announced that white women were leaving the Republican Party, he simultaneously ran to Europe to organize fascists, right? So it's an interesting thing. But I think that I've never seen research that shows that anger is somehow correlated with a rush to judgment. But I do think that what we categorize as a rush to judgment is one-sided because victims in this case of sexual assault who are coming forward are not allowed the presumption of innocence. Basically, we're saying you're guilty of lying over and over and over again when it's very clear that there are very few benefits to coming forward. I mean, Christine Blasey Ford is hiding and this man is a Supreme Court justice. So despite the claims that men's lives are being ruined over and over and over again, there's very little to support that claim. You know? So. On this side, do we have um, I just had a comment. I have a different interpretation about people saying they don't believe uh, Christine Blasey Ford. I think that many men believe she, it did happen, but they didn't, they don't think it's so terrible. Yes, I agree with So you. I think it's in the, the real thing is about definition, about, well, you know, what we do isn't so bad, so right. let's not really talk about it. And she, you know, it's like, this happened so long ago. And, because I actually knew a man, uh, I, it was, he was an acquaintance who said, if that's the definition of harassment, or what, he says, well, now I'm thinking maybe I've done that. Right. So I think that the real fear is that, you know, think they'll be exposed. Right. That's, that's I, why you have to say, no, I, it didn't and, happen. And I think that's actually two things. One of those things was evident with the Aziz Ansari article that was so jarring to people because it wasn't about criminality. It was just about, quote, unquote, normal male behavior. And it's, I think, very difficult to have to confront the idea that the way that you learn to be a man and to try and engage in a relationship with a woman is under, understood by women as threatening. What, what does that mean? This is how I learned to do this thing, right? But that also is separate from the issue of what's considered important, right? So what women are saying is important is not considered important by the men in their lives or by the society. After the Access Hollywood video was released, there was a trending hashtag called not okay. And not okay had over a million responses overnight of women saying this is not okay, this is not okay. A couple of weeks later there was a presidential debate 
and Facebook analyzed millions of comments to see what people thought was important. That, that incident and what it represented was number one for women out of top five. It wasn't on the top five for men. It didn't make the list. That is a gigantic gap in considerations of what matters. Women understand that harassment is important to everything else on their list, to the economy, to the ability to have jobs, to their health. Anything else on the list was contingent on people recognizing why the sexual harassment was of central importance to them. Whereas for men, it just went away. It was out of the brain. On this side here, um, no one on this side? Want to come down? Oh, there. Yeah, um, I wonder on the Kavanaugh subject, he kept saying, and I didn't really understand what this was supposed to do, I lifted weights. He, he drank beer. But, but he kept saying, but I lifted weights. Yes. What do you make of that? You know, I, I got to say, first of all, Katha Pollitt wrote an article in The Nation that I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. But can you actually imagine her sitting there saying dozens of times that she liked beer? <laughs> really? If Christine Blasey Ford had sat there and said, I like beer, I drink beer, I drank beer, I'll drink beer again. Right? But the lifting weights was interesting. And something else I thought was super interesting was that when he started to cry, which she avoided doing, she was really fending these tears off. When he started to cry, he immediately then mentioned his father's calendaring in what was, I believe, the first instance of filial patriarchal signaling that I'd ever seen related to calendaring. Okay? Like, the man actually used calendaring to signal a patriarchal legacy. Oh, my God. Right? And offset the tears. So he's crying, very feminine, very sensitive, very vulnerable, take care of me, I'm a little boy who's been hurt. And at the same time, he's saying, but here was my dad, and I did what my dad did, and I respect my dad, and you people need to make me a justice. Can we go back to the beer thing for one moment? Yes. Because... This is important because President Trump, in one of his many attacks on Dr. Ford, said she had one beer. She had one. And so she didn't know what she was talking about. And he talked numerous times about having beer. Well, he, I mean, I, I don't think there's really any question that there's a ridiculous double standard and that the president's a misogynist. <laughs> I, I mean, that's just like, that's just what happens, right? And so, yeah, he said what he said, and we all have to listen to him unless we can just turn down the volume and look away, which I think many of us are doing. So if we turn back 10 years, 10 years. And, and we had this conversation 10 years ago, would you have, you know, maybe this is again, me being in this other world, believed yeah. any of these things? I did. You ten would, years ago? You, ten years ago, you would have believed you could have elect a president who would th say things like that, and then ten, someone would be elected. Yeah, confirmed. Ten years ago, I stopped one job to mm. write full time about women's rights okay. because I felt like we were going backwards, and that extremists were taking over sta state legislatures. W when did that happen? When do you think? And I'm sorry, we'll get back. When did the backwards? So. The back, I mean, I think that when Susan Faludi wrote Backlash in, 2000, in 1992, right? So for those of us who watched Anita Hill, mm -hmm. right? We watched that and we're like, shit. <laughs> really? Really? You know? And then we went through the early aughts, which were a, a time of backlash in the culture. You could see it everywhere in the culture. Certainly if you had young children, you could see it. You could see it in the hyper-masculinity of superhero movies and the absurdity of princesses and like, Everywhere you turned as a parent who may have been thinking about these things, you were slapped in the face with backlash. And then really all you had to do was look at the very concerted strategic attacks on women's health and women's um, abortion rights in state after state after state. And the earliest scientific denialism in the country doesn't come from climate change. It comes from the rejection of science as it pertains to women's 
health and what, reproduction. What about tobacco? Go, that goes back to the 30s. Well, that may be an exception, but I would still argue that the policing of women's reproductive health by throwing women like Margaret Sanger in jail and calling what she was doing you know, unscientific probably is at least contemporaneous with what you're talking about. Because science deniers and authoritarians practice almost always on the most vulnerable and almost always on women within the parameters of the home. So getting back to my question, what would be the high point from which everything has gone the backlash? What was the high point? When would things have been at their best for a women's movement? Are you saying we're going back to the early so 90s? So I have to say, like, a couple of the or Yeah, better for, like, in what way do you mean? Well, if you're talking about backlash and return, uh, you, there must be a point at which every, you're, you're seeing that, things receding, there has to be a point where I, they're I receding I think there's from. more stasis. Okay. We've had stasis, right? So you and I are both in media. Yeah. And in media, the position of women and minorities has basically not changed since 1992, 94, in terms of senior management of media organizations or the ownership of radios or the ownership of um, new media. The reports over, are you disagreeing with me? No, I'm not disagreeing <laughs> with you, but I'm thinking that I happen to be at the Associated Press where yes. for the last, since I've started, the chief editorial officer has been a woman, as a matter of fact, I'm at the Associated Press because my mentor, Kathleen right. Carroll, brought me to there. But uh, do you know what the percentage of women uh, managers of newsrooms is? Or what the percentage of men writing politics stories are? I know elsewhere it's very low. No, I mean everywhere. everywhere. No, I'm saying outside of the AP. But the AP is just one place. Well, I understand that. I'm just telling you for my, uh, I'm just saying I am at a, one of those places that is a. But why is that relevant? Why diminish the one, you know, my experiences? I'm not diminishing your experiences. I'm just saying. There I'm saying to be. That, the, that the industry has the industry. failed to be inclusive. Right. And the industry has failed to be inclusive regardless of what the AP has done. Right. But there are examples of where. It, well, there are we always go examples. Back yeah. To the crowd yeah, let's go back yeah. to the crowd. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right, in the middle. Hi, uh, thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to read your book. Um, you. My question is actually around anger between women. Yes. Because I found myself, this has been a rough week, or yes. several weeks, years, as you said, um, and I'm so angry at the Susan Collins of the world. I'm right. so angry at my mother-in-law who voted right. for Trump. I'm angry at my you know, aunt who's a climate change denier. And right. then I'm like, there's this growing chasm between women, and I'm like, wait, no, I'm supposed to be angry at him. Right. <laughs> you know, or right. I don't know if you could just speak to that a little so bit. So I actually, when I first outlined the book, there was an entire chapter just called Other Women. And then as I wrote, it became much more important to integrate that issue into every chapter, right? What happens when we're children? Why is it that in a patriarchal society, the most acceptable form of anger a girl can have is to rabidly hate her mother? Right? That is it. When you're a girl, you're basically allowed to get mad at your mother. Right? That's what teenage life is supposed to be like. When my girls were 11, I sat them down and I said, you're not obliged to hate me. <laughs> right? I am not your enemy. I am your greatest advocate. And we need to talk about every Disney movie that you ever saw. <laughs> right? Because I like those Disney movies, but they are full of crap. Right? So. I think that it, it starts when we're really young. And the acceptability of being angry with another woman as opposed to being angry at the men, right? If you think of the way films have, have portrayed anger, catfighting narratives were dominant until recently. Um, if you saw women in sports, you saw them as individual athletes, not as parts of teams. That's shifted, right? In, in recent years, we've seen a lot more depictions of women working in solidarity. They're still few and far between. But our entire imagination, our entire emotional imagination, assumes that we can and will be angry with other women because we're supposed to stay in our separate spheres. I mean, the thing that the, GP, the GOP does over and over and over again is pit women against women. I mean, for God's sake, they found a woman prosecutor and then they shut her up in the middle of their own confirmation yes. hearing, right? They're like, we need a woman. 
to talk to the women, right? As though we speak an entirely different language. So I want to ask the question as to why that acceptability. I have great anger about that, that what you just described, right? But I try very hard to think, okay, why am I freer with that anger? I have, I have every right to be angry about that. It's a confrontation that we have over and over and over again. But I'm also aware that it's an acceptable form of anger for me. And so I resist, I resist anything that's acceptable now. So just to tell her what, uh, yes. yeah, one or two pieces of advice, what to do now. With so I think it depends on the context, right? I think the anger is different if you are in school or at work or you're sitting at a family dinner or if you're in a hospital room, right? You're not gonna get angry in the hospital room, but you might get angry in the kitchen. I think you have to deliberately think, what do I want to accomplish with this anger? I have this anger. It has no uptake, ba basically, is what you're saying. How, how do I, why do I feel, because what you're describing to me is powerlessness. I feel powerlessness in this anger. And so you can do a couple of things, right? I mean, in my mind, there are women that I've just written off, and, and I'm like, well, I'm just gonna talk to your children. Because then every dinner you have, I'm at the table with you. But I don't have to do that work, right? So I think you can decide. And to me, the most important thing is to just deliberately strategize. Because otherwise, the anger can consume you. It, it can just render you really powerless. But you can reject that. Does that help? Yeah. Um, anyone in this or up, up front here? Um. <laughs> there's a young man here. Yes, I think there's a, where's the mic? Up here. Yeah. Oh, oh, two. Oh. <laughs> In stereo. <laughs> um, going back to the Kavanaugh hearing, do you yeah. believe that Kavanaugh was actually angry, or do you believe he was trying to appeal to uh, his tr like the Trump base? So I think there were two things. I think he was terribly angry and indignant. I mean, I think he was really upset at being held accountable publicly and, and being held accountable by a woman that he poss possibly had forgotten. This is the other thing about sexual assault. Women's lives are forever altered by these assaults, and most men forget they ever happened, right? And so, yes, I think he was genuinely angry. I also think that he put on a spectacular performance for the president, who likes to see that, right, and for the the people who were already supporting him in the room and for the people who support the presidency. So I think it's all of those things. But yes, I think he was genuinely angry. And what about the exchange with Andy Klobuchar? Um, oh, when he asked her if um, it, she ever came? Yeah. yeah, is that not a good example of this? Uh, well, I just think there's so much contempt for women. I just think that he, he had no restrictions on the disdain that sort of he showed in that moment. And, you know, I mean, I think if he was trying to convince anybody that he, that he wasn't an ugly, angry drunk, he, he didn't do a very good job. He was sober, as far as I know, right? <laughs> so. Okay, so. Uh, we're I have a question, actually. Oh, oh. thanks. Um, I haven't read your book yet, I can't wait to. Um, Where are you? Oh, down, down here. here. Hi. I thought she was coming oh, I from thought up you there. were up there, too. I, I was going to say, it seemed to be coming <clears throat> from up there. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, so, so far, I've only read the inside jacket of your yes. book. I can't wait to start it as soon as I get home. Um, but I'm so fascinated um, by this description um, that probably someone else wrote, but that yes, um, our rage is one of the most important resources we have, our sharpest tool against both personal and political oppression. Yes. I'd love for you to speak more about that, because sure. I have a lot of rage, and I yes. can't wait to use it as a sharp tool. <laughs> so uh, honestly, For good. Like, I think that the core issue is that by severing the emotion of anger from the idea of femininity, we sever women's rights to self-defense from, the, from them, right? I mean, anger is a signal emotion. It tells you that something is wrong. We are all here because we have developed this emotion. And this emotion is a warning to us. But instead of allowing us to think clearly about what we're being warned about, we are instead taught to ruminate, which makes us sick. We're taught to divert, which makes us powerless. We're taught to silence ourselves, which renders the things that we need and want and feel invisible to the society. And so all I'm saying is that's bad, 
like everything, we're supposed to assume that indignity is imminent in femininity because we are not allowed to defend our dignity. And that's what anger, that's where I think anger is most important because it doesn't have to be linked to contempt and fear and resentment or disgust. It can equally be linked to a sense of justice and compassion and empathy. And what I'm saying is, why don't we talk about anger as a feminine virtue? Why don't we allow boys to be sad? Why don't we allow them to talk about need? Why don't we allow girls and women to claim assertiveness and to even use their aggression. I mean, one of the things that I write about that is so important in this moment is the effect of Title IX. We aren't talking about Title IX. Title IX is usually associated with sports, but it's really about leadership. And now we have not one, but two generations of women, so we have an intergenerational legacy of women who have worked on teams, used their bodies with incredible competence, understood the uses of aggression and physicality, known that there are differences between being assertive and aggressive and angry, are comfortable in competitive situations. And we see that in these social movements. We see it in, you know, Me Too, we see it online, we see it in the fact that white women are confronting other white women openly about what it means to claim whiteness and oppress other people. You know, that is a sea change in a lot of ways. And I think a lot of it has to do with Title IX's impact on girls' education. And, okay, one last question, and then we have to, to wrap this up. Um, Hi, um, can you hello. speak to a little bit about like Serena's rage that yes. she had to face in the US Open? Because yes. I think as a black person in America, you're staying in a constant state of rage, constant. and just watching her go off and be treated like that, like. I don't even know why they could even think that we're watching tennis. I mean, no one was tuned in at three o'clock to watch some of these other players. Yeah, I know. That was amazing, right? The main thing to take away from what happened that day to me is the fact that she was levied the highest ever fine in the US Open for verbal abuse. Now, just think about how ridiculous that was. There are you know, endless videos showing men, up until the week before, behaving far more egregiously. As a matter of fact, the week before, wasn't there an instance of a, of a ref who went and counseled a player that he wanted to help him? Do you remember that? I mean, it was quite astounding. But in that case, too, here was a woman who was expected to act in the moment, in another example of false equivalence, with the erasure of the years of discrimination that she has faced in her own sport. Right, so not only had she recently not been allowed to wear the um, compression suit that was vital to her health, not only has she been drug tested over and over and over again disproportionately, not only has she been compared to an animal over and over and over again, but we're just supposed to ignore all of that and expect her not to defend herself or her honor or you know, interact with this man in a way that is more demure than her male uh, peers would have. I, I mean, I, I, just, I just found it astounding. I really did. And, and I think, too, that what's even more important, of course, is the media coverage after. Editors pick. Do they want to show a picture of an unhinged, crazy black woman? Or do they want to show the moment in which she embraced and supported her competitor? They make a decision when they do that. They make a decision when they run the racist cartoon that, sh that showed Osaka as a blonde ponytailed girl who was smiling quietly on the side. I mean, every one of those decisions really matters. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> you know, But I think that as, as carefully as white women need to feel that they have to calibrate themselves, that's tenfold for black women. I mean, Anita Hill couldn't even say she was terrified. You know, she couldn't show that vulnerability. She had to sit there and just be calm and possess, self-possessed the entire time. And so, you know, all of these intersections of identity, if you're a, a woman of Asian descent, you're just sort of expected to be docile, really nice and polite and cute. And God, you should probably wear a schoolgirl dress, you know? And, well, and, and, and since they were so soon, um, so adjacent in time. Mm -hmm. Can you compare the anger 
that she expressed in the way she expressed it to the anger that Brett Kavanaugh expressed in terms of... I don't think I can because the contexts were so different. Okay. I mean, you know, male tennis players have repeatedly said, male tennis players who've been criticized for their angry outbursts and yet still called the bad boys of the sport, yeah. right? I mean, these guys who've lost their shit it, on tennis courts, they're glorified for their behavior over and over John and over McEnroe. again. John McEnroe, you know, and you just don't see that for a woman like Serena Williams. She is just not given that benefit of the doubt and certainly not the glory that comes with this expression of emotion, you know? Yeah. But that's on a, that's a sports, I mean, we're talking about the Supreme Court. Right, like, I mean, do, do you think he showed more anger, perhaps inappropriately more than she did, and yet didn't get, and yet he still got confirmed? Or am I? I don't know, I think they're apples and oranges. I mean, he behaved badly. He just did. Mm -hmm. Then nothing justifies his yeah. behavior in that courtroom. Oh, no, I'm not asking that. I'm yeah. asking you to sit, to draw the comparisons. You don't think they, there's a... I, don't, I mean, do you think there are comparisons? I think, yeah, I'm wondering if, if his was, I'm asking if his was more extreme and the punishment I don't less. think. I just can't compare those two scenes. Okay, so the one last question to finish this up. Yeah. And if we can finish this up sort of in a future looking and perhaps optimistic mm -hmm. looking, you talk in, in, in the book about what you're seeing now. Mm -hmm. um, the women's marches, science march, the, Oklahoma, the teachers revolts, which yes. by the way you said were almost, were all female, which actually no, I said that teachers are 78% right. women. But yeah, okay, because the revolts were mostly women, but there were some male organizers there too. There are always some men that are. No, fine. no, no, no. But it was. But it, <laughs> if you look at Oklahoma, the 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 main organizer was. So uh, let's let's talk about this uh, for a moment because here's the issue with teaching. It has to be desegregated. Yes. Right. Most superintendents are men. They get paid more. They have more respect. They're accorded more um, control over these environments. Money. More money. And so having women make up the bulk of teachers and having men make up the bulk of people that they report to is a really piss poor example for children. And it's not just in the schools, but it's in universities, isn't it? It's everywhere. Yeah. Just And what about... Like, in, there's really nowhere it's not. Okay. And in terms of where it breaks down on, and the principal... Is it on uh, the principal level, is it still mostly male, or is that? It, I think uh, it depends on whether you're talking about public schools or private schools or parochial schools. Okay. All of those differ, but it is uniformly true that women make up the bulk of teachers yeah. and that men make up the bulk of superintendents. I was just wondering if that's where you see the upward movement, because what I really want to get to is you, you know, can you tell us, are you seeing hope here? So, you know, it's interesting. I think there's hope. I think there's hope in things like the impact of Title IX. I think there's hope in the fact that uh, young women are much more comfortable expressing themselves politically. I think there's hope in the fact that the Me Too movement is actually saying, men, we are giving you a chance. We are giving you a chance to believe what we're saying. A lot of men say, well, I don't have a road to redemption here. I'm automatically being considered a rapist or a bad guy, when in fact, that's not true. The entire Me Too movement is predicated on the idea that men will believe women. That is a tremendous leap of faith in the current environment because men are demonstrably showing that they are not believing women. So if we want hopefulness, I think all we have to do is look at the Me Too movement and say, what is this movement trying to say in the society? And so I think it is hopeful that more women are being believed, but they're being believed by other women. So the issue is if men want a path to redemption, they need to set their egos aside, and they need to listen to what women are saying and believe them. And that includes, frankly, not saying not all men, right? Because that's a real sticking point. We aren't stupid. We know not all men are racist. Or not all men, are, they're not rapists, they're not racist. There are good men everywhere. We are related to them, and they're trying their hardest. That is all irrelevant to what we're saying because we need them to step up and change the way they interact with other men. That's the main thing we can't do, you know? So I think that it's, it's pretty hopeful. Like a lot of people in the last two weeks have been saying, do you think Me Too is over? And all I can do to that is sort of laugh. I'm like, 
we have just not even started here. Yeah. Like, yeah. like this is not even like one second into the 12 hour clock. You know, and I think that's really more scary to some people. The idea that it's not a beginning, but an end, uh, not an end, but a beginning. And that is a good place to. Yes, it's a good place to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.